And in this series and throughout this entire initiative, our number one goal has been simple. We have been praying and believing for 100% engagement. I mean, your, your mind can just run wild in imagination when you think of a church where everybody gets on board. And I believe God is doing something in our church that is pretty profound and remarkable. And I believe we are going to see these goals met. And here's the deal. It's just something we've been saying. Everyone can do something which has been really inspiring to me, just hearing the different stories and statistics and metrics coming out of our next-gen departments where children and teenagers are playing their part and they're making a difference in the world. Everyone can do something and some can do more. Some of you are in a season where you just sense God challenging you and you are leveling up in your faith and you are taking steps in your spiritual maturity. You are finding, hey, in this season, I can do more. And in addition to that, few can do the unthinkable, which I don't have any insider information. I wish I did and make it easier to make statements like this. Uh, but I do just sense that God is doing profound things in and through our church. And for some of you, this is legacy season. And God is calling you and maybe your family to go in at a level that you've never done before. And for years to come, the next generation and the future of our church is going to be impacted greatly by your obedience and faith. And so we just celebrate every single person showing up ready to participate in God's work, amen. We have been in this series called Open. And the whole idea is for you and I to live open to the things of God. Right, that God is responsive to our openness to Him. And in week one, we talked about living with an open mind. That we talked about this idea that generosity is a genius way of living. That following Christ, it's it's brilliant. And there is a logical side to our biblical approach in life. That being a Christian doesn't mean you have to check your reason at the door. No, that you can harness the internal mental faculties that God has gifted you with to harness this life of faith with Christ. It's a brilliant approach to life, amen? We too, we talked about living with an open heart. And we talked about this passage that says each and every one of us should decide within our heart what the Lord is calling us to give. That generosity is not just a heart's decision. Generosity reveals your heart's condition. In other words, it's not a wealth issue. It's a health issue. And then we talked about living with an open hand. That somehow in ways that we can't explain and in ways it's almost impossible to measure this side of eternity, somehow when we entrust God with whatever we're holding on to, he multiplies and he utilizes and he advances his work in the world in ways we can't take credit for, but my goodness, are we privileged to be a part of it. And so it's saying, God, I live open-handed and I trust you. Last week, we talked about living open 24-7, that the goal for every single one of us who calls ourselves followers of Christ is to anchor ourselves to him and to live upon his word and to be a Christian in good seasons and in bad seasons. Come on, that ought to be the goal. Let's not just be Christians when it's easy, but let's be Christians when it matters. And I find that those who stand on the word of God, well, they stand in the storms of life and they bring a strength and a resolve and a light and a hope and a grace to the world. And so we are open 24 seven. And God, no matter what I'm going through, I know you're with me and I stand faithful despite it all, amen. And today we are going to, end with this idea of an open heaven. The scripture is very clear in its call for you and I to live a generous life. And it's very clear in how God responds to our generosity. And it's this idea that you find all throughout scripture in terms of being blessed by God. Have you ever bumped into that? Scripture speaks a great deal about being blessed. Scripture speaks a great deal about the favor of God resting upon our lives. And in this final message, I wanna try to provide our church with a a balanced and maybe more accurate approach to this idea of blessing than some have been taught. It makes me think of my kids. I'm, I'm trying to raise polite children. Anyone else you're trying to raise polite children? I'd encourage you to do so because the world needs them. And, uh, I tend to, when I sneeze, I always sneeze four times. Come on, anyone else wave at me if you are a multiple sneezer? I almost always sneeze four times. Yeah, I'm around some friendly folks. And the other day I was sneezing and I said, achoo, 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 achoo. And after every sneeze, my kids hit me with a bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. 
And they've been doing this for some time now. And finally, I just said, hey, kids, we got to talk about this. Whenever dad sneezes, I'm always going to sneeze four times. You don't have to bless each sneeze. You can just let me get down the road in my sneezing and then just bless it all at once when I'm done. And I say that because I think a lot of Christians approach blessing the way my kids approached my sneezes. God, I went to church, are you gonna bless me? God, I prayed over my meal, are you gonna bless me? God, I was nice to my coworker, are you gonna bless me? And we almost live with an entitlement when it comes to the blessing of God where we're constantly demanding him to bless every small act of faithfulness in our life. And that's not what we're after today. I think we should recognize that God's already been really good to us. And if all we got is Christ on a cross atoning for our sins, we are blessed beyond measure and we are spoiled beyond belief. His goodness is outstanding. Nevertheless, he seeks to, well, he just seeks to bestow his goodness upon our life. And I want us to understand maybe just maybe what scripture's getting at. The anchor verse of this series is this, where in 2 Corinthians it says, remember this, which anytime scripture gets repetitive or anytime scripture says the word remember, it is God's simple nudge of saying humanity tends to be forgetful in this area. Hey, remember this, whoever so sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now put on your imagination caps for a second. If you were to find a farmer standing in a barren field that he never planted a seed in, yet he was frustrated that it wasn't bearing crops, you would think to yourself, that farmer is nuts. You can't be frustrated about what you're not growing if you're not gonna focus on what you're not sowing. And in the same way, we can look at that farmer and be like, that's a bizarre approach to life. Sometimes Christians are exposed to the same thing. God, why aren't you doing this in my life the way you see it being done in other people's lives? And maybe, just maybe, it has to do with your own sowing. But he goes on to say, whoever, no, 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 let's come back. Whoever sows generously, this is an idea that's all throughout scripture, will also reap generously. Each of you should decide what you have, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because we're not that kind of church. We're just not that kind of church. No, 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 that's not what we're after. None of us are given reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness, this is the theme throughout this idea, endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. And check out this statement will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I, I think this is something where we get exposed when it comes to the blessing conversation. We are very limited and we're very shallow in our desire for how we see God blessing us. And in this moment, it's saying, hey, God will rich you and God will bless you. And how will he bless you? By granting you a harvest of righteousness Oh my goodness, that's so much better. I think for the parents in the room, come on, you have to align with this. I would rather my kids be righteous than rich. Amen. Oh my goodness, God, give them character, not just income. I would rather them be righteous, not rich. It goes on to say, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now check this out. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. I, I think this is where the world gets critical of the church. I think the world recognizes that at times there's some inconsistencies and some pretty significant gaps between our beliefs 
and our behaviors. I think sometimes folks are exposed for calling themselves Christians, but in all reality, they profess faith, but they don't possess faith. And I think in this passage, scripture is drawing our attention that, hey, people will give thanks for the fact that your behavior lines up with your beliefs and your confession of the gospel is true in the way in which you live your life. That is so fascinating to me. Going on, it says, and for your generosity and sharing with them and with everyone else and in their prayers, for you, their hearts will go out to you because of their surpassing Grace, Uh, again, I think anytime we separate grace from generosity, we end up with the wrong thing. That's why I said, wherever you find a lack of generosity, it's not a giving problem. It's a gospel problem. They have not fully understood the magnitude of grace and what God has done on behalf of them. And I think these two concepts have to remain in continuity with one another in order for us to understand what the Bible's after. It says this grace that God has given you and thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I think this is a great exercise because I think sometimes we need to discover how limited our language actually is. You should go home and take some time to describe the gift of Christ and the gospel and how good God has been to you. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna get down the road and you're gonna realize, ugh, I don't have the right words and my vocabulary is limited. And as in the best of my ability and my best attempt, I can't fully describe how good he is. I love that. I love that God surpasses our ability to articulate it. And in this passage, we we kinda get this all-encompassing, full circle view of generosity. And what I would say is giving is a win, win, win. Now, a lot of times when we think in these terms, we always think of win-win scenarios. But in this passage, it's clear, this is threefold. There's a win, win, win scenario. And what I mean by that is first off, giving, it blesses God. Something a lot of people don't take into account. People don't really consider, hey, what is my relationship with God truly like? And I think most of us can relate to being in a one-sided relationship at times. You ever been in a one-sided relationship? Maybe you're giving it your all, really invested, exhausting yourself, spending a lot of energy to edify the relationship, but the other individual just isn't as committed or invested as you are. That's a one-sided relationship. Another way of calling it is that is a dysfunctional relationship. And I would just ask you the question, when you consider your relationship with God, is there any chance that it's one-sided? And I love this idea that we can live in such a way that it blesses God. And I wanna live in such a way that puts wind in his sail, not to say that he needs it, but I just want him to know that I love him dearly and I'm committed to the relationship. You know, there's this fascinating passage in scripture that says Jesus was once surprised Now, that'll throw some of your theology through a ringer. How does an all-knowing God get surprised? And what surprised him? It was a man's faith who had a child who was ill. And the centurion man came and said, hey, I believe you can heal my child. And it says Jesus was astonished and he was surprised by the man's faith. Now, think about that because as I think about this weekend across all of our campuses, I can't help but think, Man, how amazing would it be if this weekend were a surprise party for Jesus? If we just showed up with so much faith that the savior of the world found himself astonished and delighted, even blessed by our faith. Our giving, it blesses God. In addition to that, giving, it blesses others. And you'll you'll hear me say this often, but one of the best things you can do for yourself is to do something for someone else. I'll say it again. One of the best things you can do for yourself is to do something for someone else. Oh my goodness, can you imagine 
the impact, the influence that the next generation would have if we were to raise them up to think like this? I mean, when you look at our culture and our society, narcissism is on the rise. We have become self-centered and selfish and it is only trending more in that direction. And I think the next generation that we get to raise up could be a bright light of hope in the world that says, no, we're not selfish, we're selfless. And we're selfless because we follow a savior who was selfless. And I think what is so genius about generosity is it heals the world. It blesses others. And what's amazing to me is there's that statement where it says others will give thanks to God because of your generosity. That's so amazing. Individuals around the world who may not know your name, may not ever get to thank you in person this side of eternity. They may not know how exactly it came about, but they just know somebody operated in faith and it is, well, it is changing and impacting their life. That kids right now around the world will wake up to clean water, a warm meal, clothes on their back and a shelter over their head that was provided by this church and daily they give thanks to God for your generosity. I I love that. I I think as followers of Christ, the true mark of maturity isn't individuals who are after credit, but individuals who are after giving God glory. No, we don't don't need credit. We don't need attention. We don't need people to celebrate us. We just wanna live in a way that results in more glory, more honor, more exalting, more praise, more thanks to our heavenly father. That it blesses others. But here's the last thing, giving. It blesses us. This is all throughout scripture. In fact, Jesus himself, what did he say? It is more blessed to give than to receive, that there is a blessing. There's something about living a generous life that is refreshing and fulfilling and rewarding. But sometimes I think we need to stare at the paradigms in which we operate with because subtle distinctions make a big difference. And no, there's a big difference between giving to get and getting to give. And it's clear, the second one is our target. No, we don't don't give to get. That's reducing God to an idol. That's reducing God to a genie in a bottle who is just there to grant you your wishes or some carnival barker who you paid your price of admission and now you want your prize. That's shallow. No, we, we get to give. We get to be a part of God's redemptive story in the world. We get to be on team Jesus and we get to see this grace and this hope and this peace and this joy and this ministry of reconciliation advance throughout the world. What a privilege. Oh my goodness, what a privilege. This is why last week we said the joy in giving is found in the privilege, not the provision. It's not saying, God, what are you gonna do for me? It's saying, you've already done enough. I stand ready to play my part. Nevertheless, scripture wants us to be aware of God's desire and God's response to our faith. You'll hear me say often, but faith, it is a two-way street, meaning the traffic runs in both directions. What I mean by that is our faith honors God and God honors our faith. That God blesses and bestows his favor upon our lives when you and I take him at his word. Now, that said, this is where we go sideways in the church. And sometimes we create two camps and quite honestly, I don't think either one is biblical. We create this prosperity gospel that says, hey, become a Christian and you'll be wealthy and rich. And God will just give you a ton of money. What show of hands if that didn't happen in your life, right? Yes, that just doesn't stand up over time. And it's a weak theology. And then there's this other side of the spectrum where we've developed within faith communities a strange form of righteousness, self-righteousness. And it's clothed in poverty where suddenly we shame individuals who've worked hard, been great stewards, managed their money well, and now they reap the benefits of their good decisions. 
And I think as followers of Christ, we live in the balanced middle of recognizing it's neither one, but God has something to say on this topic of blessing. And here's the thing, what you have to understand about our God is God does not want his kids to be entitled. My goodness, we do not need another entitled person running around out there. God does not want his kids to be entitled. On the contrary, God wants his kids to be entrusted. No, he's not trying to spoil us in a way that destroys our character, but he's trying to develop us in a way that harnesses our capacity. Oh, let it sink in, church. It's not to respond to our faith in a way that tarnishes our character, but it is to respond to our faith in a way that harnesses our capacity. There's more in store for you. And so here here would be another distinction. God is not concerned with our affluence, which most people are familiar with the idea of living under the influence. And I think a lot of people are also found living under the affluence, intoxicated by the ways of the world, intoxicated by materialism and possessions, intoxicated with fleeting things. And we've become addict to these things. And I don't think if you go through the pages of scripture, God is concerned with your affluence. No, that will lead to entitlement. And on the contrary, God is concerned with your influence. Right, that God is concerned with you making a difference in the world. Again, it's not entitlement, it's being entrusted. It's not affluence, it's influence. And God said, hey, I seek to make a platform out of your life. Have you ever thought about that? Is my life a platform for the glory of God? Is God seeking to enlarge my territory of influence also that he can show the world around me how good he is and what he's able to do when someone takes him at his word? It's influence that he's after. Another way of thinking about it is God is not concerned with your income. Instead, God is concerned with your outcome. What does your life produce? Have you ever thought about that? What what is the results of your decisions, the results of your faithfulness? When you are inserted into the equation, do you make that school better? Do you make that household or family better? Do you make that team or company better? What's the outcome of your life? Here's another way of asking it. What kind of human or what kind of Christian does your house produce? And it's just learning to lean into these fascinating things and say, hey, God is seeking to produce something in my life and he's concerned with the outcome. But where we get exposed is we are very shallow and limited in our thinking of God's blessing. This is not a judgment, but this is just exposing what's real of many of us. And most of us, when we think of God's blessing, we reduce the idea simply to monetary matters. We only think of God's blessing in financial ways. But here's a short list of ways in which God blesses us. Sure, God can bless you with finances, but God will bless you relationally. And for the record, I would rather have a better marriage than more money. Can I get an amen, church? I would rather have a better marriage. I would rather have a better relationship with my kids than more money. We overrate finances. In addition to that, God will bless you at times professionally. Oh my goodness, take it from this guy who finds himself in a position that quite honestly, I don't think I deserve this. I'm not entitled to any of this, but by the grace of God, I get to serve in this capacity. What a blessing. And sometimes you'll find that God will do that in your life. He'll bless you professionally, physically. All the times we've seen God heal people of chronic illnesses and he does it over and over and over again. What a blessing. And God can heal you of anxiety and depression and God can go to work in areas of your mind. God blesses you mentally or emotionally. God even blesses us situationally. Well, sometimes we don't think about this, but you've, you've said some things at times that align with this idea. You ever thought to yourself, man, I just so happen to be in the right place 
at the right time around the right people and I had the right conversation. And somehow when I look back, hindsight is 2020 and I can trace the hand of God orchestrating his redemptive work in my life. Somehow God aligned the situations in my life. And that's when I met her. And that's when I met him. And that's when God saved my life in radical ways. You ever thought about that? I mean, think about this. Every single day, we drive to our offices, to our schools. We, we drive to practices and tournaments. We drive home for the holidays. We spend a lot of time in the car. And you ever been amazed by how little you get in car wrecks? Folks, I've seen some of you drive. <laughs> we have some bad drivers out here. And I always get a kick out of the times I see a bad driver with a Northview sticker on it. I'm like, oh man, that's so funny to me. And I think sometimes when pain strikes in our life, we give a ton of attention to pain. Yet we give so little attention to protection. When I get to heaven, I have an agenda. I don't know if that's allowed, but if God lets me, there's some things I'd like to discuss and see. And I just want him to play the highlight reel of my life. God, would you show me all the times in which you saved my life and I wasn't even aware of it? God, can you show me of all the times where you were just orchestrating the situations in my life to where you were moving me and helping me navigate your plan and will for my life and I didn't see it. And God, I just wanna know so I can give you the adequate praise that you deserve. Anyone just been amazed by how God is involved in your situation? He will bless you situationally. God will bless you spiritually. Again, we, we overrate these things. When you start to look at this list, finances drops to the bottom pretty quickly. Again, I would rather my kid be a person of integrity than a person of high income. And it's just saying, God, would you bless us spiritually? Would you make us godly individuals? In addition to that, God will bless you eternally which is fascinating all throughout scripture. It draws our attention to heaven and the fact that every person lives forever somewhere. And I grew up in churches and in spaces where individuals would say, hey, every good deed of faithfulness comes with a jewel in your crown and a bigger mansion in heaven. And I don't know if that's good theology, but it always intrigued me. And what I do know to be true, and you'll find this all throughout God's word, is how we live here has an impact on how we live there. What we do now shapes what we do then. And it's just saying, hey, God, you are blessing me beyond the grave in ways I can't fully understand in this moment. In addition to that, God will bless you exponentially. That there will be things that take place that you're like, we did not even see that coming. We didn't even know to pray for that. Last week at the 11 o'clock service right here, we had 21 individuals who are part of our prison campus who have now been released and are out in the community, a part of our church family, serving in remarkable ways, making a difference. It's amazing the redemptive stories in our church community. Is that not outstanding? 21 of them gathered with us last weekend. And what I love about it is after service, they had lunch and some of the staff got to join them. And during lunch, they were like, hey, let's call Molly. Molly was a part of our prison campus. Molly still continues to attend church online. But after she was released, Molly and her husband moved to California. So the ladies were like, hey, let's call Molly. And so they FaceTime Molly and she answers the call. And as she answers the call, guess what she's doing? Her and her husband are out on the streets feeding homeless people. And here's what's amazing. Come to find out they've launched their own homeless organization in which they serve the homeless within that community. I mean, that's amazing. When you start a prison campus, you don't think, hey, we're starting a prison campus that's going to launch a homeless ministry on the other side of the country. You just can't, you just can't predict this stuff. God blesses you exponentially. I love that. And so again, it is balancing our understanding of this conversation. Scripture would say this in Malachi. It says, bring the whole tithe. Now, if you miss week one, Scripture says a lot about giving, and it all boils down into three categories. Priority giving, 
in which God is first, percentage giving in which the tithe, the 10% is the baseline and the starting point for the follower of Christ, and progressive giving, that the more we follow him, we just grow in our generosity. Here he's talking about percentage giving. And he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me in this, which old school preachers that I grew up with always took time to emphasize. This is the only place in scripture where God says, test me. Apparently that's important to highlight. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. He says, hey, when you open-handedly entrust me with your resources, I open the floodgates of heaven. And here's the principle I want you to walk away with. Open hands, open heaven. And I love that statement. God's like, see, if I don't pour out such a blessing, you're not able to contain it. I'm telling you, God will bless you in emotional ways that you will have a joy that you can't contain. God will bless you in character that you won't be able to hide the fact that you just walk humbly in the world. That there is an overflow of his work in our life and is recognizing this is God's desire. It's amazing because in it, it says, thus says the Lord God Almighty. Which you should know, our God does not make predictions. He only makes promises. He doesn't waffle in his word. And I find that this is the case for many people. God desires to fulfill his promises more than we desire to receive them. Have you ever wanted something more for an individual than they want it for themselves? That can be a frustrating tension and God's like, oh, I want you to experience abundant life. I mean, the life Jesus died to give you. And I think God desires to keep us in his promises and his blessing. And I find that scripture is, is drawing us to this idea. And I love the idea that as we take him at his word, what does scripture say? The surrounding nations and those who look upon your life will call you blessed. That they'll look at your marriage. They'll look at the, the children you've raised, the company you built. They'll look at your career and how you endured illness. They'll look at how you steward finances and how you respond to the chaos of the world. And they'll say, that is so different. It stands in contrast to the rest of the world around us. That's a blessed way of, give, of living. And here's the deal. I think, and scripture would point us to this, when we give God our first and our best, we can trust him to bless the rest. And so it's just coming before God saying, you are so trustworthy, I trust you. You know, recently I was with our staff and we have these monthly staff huddles and I showed up prepared to, to give a leadership talk. And it just really turned into a cool moment where we called an audible and it was a time of worship and prayer and it was really powerful. And in that moment, it triggered a thought about something in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is known as the triumphal entry in which Jesus arrives on the scene and, and the crowd begins to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're praising and they're exalting him. And in the crowd of worship comes some warfare. You should just know that warfare often will attach itself to your worship. That the birthmark of a Christian is a target and it's sometimes awkward to talk about, but I would be irresponsible as a pastor not to say your obedience comes with some resistance. And so there's this group of people and they're worshiping Jesus and some religious people with a critical spirit rise up in the crowd and they start to condemn the situation. And Jesus responds to them. And watch how he responds. It says, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, in other words, you should know better. You're the religious elite. You're supposed to be godly people. You should know better. Had known on this day the things that would make for peace. If only you knew what was needed in the moment. He goes on to say, but now 
They are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and you and your children within you. It's like, wow, these are really uncomfortable statements, Jesus. He goes on to say, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you. And check out this statement. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. What you gotta understand and where a lot of people misinterpret Jesus is Jesus doesn't give threats. Jesus gives explanations. He's saying, hey, look, uh, let me explain to you what your decisions are going to produce. Let me explain to you the results of your behavior. He's saying, because you missed what I was doing in the world, because you gave yourself over to worldly tendencies, now the world is going to overtake you. He's saying to a group of people, I was doing something among you and you missed it. And now the result is undesirable. And that statement, because you missed the time of your visitation. And I just told the staff that that statement rocked me to my core. I don't ever wanna miss what God is doing around me. I don't ever want us as a church to miss God's moment of visitation where it's like God was stirring things up in our community and we got to be a part of something that was so much bigger than the part we played. You know, when I wake up my kids every day, I, I tend to be repetitive. I say the same thing all the time. So I walk into my boys' room, I flip the lights on and I say, good morning, gentlemen, every day, the same thing. And my boys have started to razz me about it. Dad, every day, all you say is, good morning, gentlemen. And I said, that's right. And you will know every single day you are expected to be a gentleman. They're becoming extinct out there and we need you to go out there and reproduce. <laughs> You're gonna be a gentleman. And in addition to that, I will often sing the song that I was taught growing up, rise and shine. Come on, finish it with me and give God the glory, glory. Wave at me if you knew that song growing up. Yeah, a lot of church folks, I love it. That was the jam. The other day I was singing it to my daughter, rise and shine and give God the glory. And it kind of struck me in that moment. Is this song about a morning or is this song about a moment? I think my whole life, I just assumed it was about the morning. And I just wonder, is there any chance that the writer was concerned about the moments we get to operate in? And there come moments where as people of faith, we rise and we shine and we give God the glory. What a privilege, what a privilege. And right now I'm in the season where my confidence is at an all time high and it has nothing to do with me personally, but it has everything to do with the people I'm surrounded by and the spaces I get to be in. Where I go from Meeting to meeting, they tend to just sign me up for a bunch of them. And, and, and I get to hang out with some really talented folks on our team. And it doesn't matter what meeting I'm in, I walk away and I think to myself, oh my goodness, they stand ready for an absolute move of God. Recently, I was meeting with some of our groups department and hearing all the things that they are rolling out in terms of small groups and the curriculum that they're putting together and the writing teams that they've assembled and the tools and the things that they are putting in place because they care so deeply about your personal transformation. I mean, this group, you get together and you bring up the word discipleship and they go nuts. And I walk away from those meetings. I'm like, man, we're gonna do it because those people are called and ready to see it come to pass. Then I was in another meeting where they were going through some statistics through our marriage ministry. We just launched this marriage initiative through the first initiative and already what it is accomplishing is astonishing. And what was amazing in that meeting is one of our executive pastors was going through a list of all the goals moving forward and the different benchmarks and things that they're setting out to do. And it is so aggressive. And I'm like, wow, this team is going to take our state by storm and they are going to bless and minister and empower and help marriages all around our state. They stand 
ready. I, I mean, I'll meet with our family ministries department and hear about what they're planning with the family framework and all the resources that they're putting together to help empower parents and train up children. And it's like, wow, they too stand ready. Recently, I was in some meetings with some of the unsung heroes of our church. One of the greatest tragedies in the church world is people like myself and individuals who stand on a platform get way too much credit. It's kind of disgusting in my point of view because we have true heroes behind the scenes. Like I look at our finance team, our HR team. I look at the people who work in areas of facilities and the legal side of things. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we are so blessed with accountants and CPAs and lawyers and brilliant people who operate faithfully behind the scenes, who serve our church and add tremendous value in ways that will never fully be understood and seen by most, but we would not be the church we are if it wasn't for those heroes behind the scene. Can we show them some love? I mean, it's amazing. And, and, and I'll walk out and I'll think, oh, they, they stand ready. That's a great group. I'll be in other spaces like our trustee meetings in which appointed lay leaders are appointed to help steward and guide the financial decisions of our church. And I'm telling you, we are so blessed. I mean, the individuals who serve on our trustee team are brilliant and they're skilled in ways that I'm not. And a lot of times they say things that I'm pulling out my phone, Googling what they just said, like, wow, that's... Sounds sophisticated, um, but you should just know, my goodness, are we blessed with wonderful people who are committed to advancing what God's doing here. I'll be a part of an elder meeting where we have elders who have been a part of our church for four decades. And you hear them pray and you hear them articulate what they sense God is doing in our church. And you just, again, you walk away and you're like, I don't know. I think God might do something among us. And then you do a worship tour and you show up on every campus and you see people come out on weeknights exalting God and going after him with their whole heart. And you just think to yourself, man, they too stand ready. And church, I'm just convinced God's about to do something in our life and I can't take an ounce of credit but I'm so excited. Anyone else to see what God does next in and through our church? I'm excited.